A very good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the launch event for the new book, Nation to Nation, Scotland's Place in the World by Stephen Gethins. I'm Tom McLeod. I'm a presenter and journalist for Sky News. Uh, delighted to be hosting this chat and Q&A, which has kindly been put together by the publisher of Stephen's book, Lewis Press. Before we do get fully underway, a few things for attendees to note. Firstly, as you might have seen already in the chat box, we're going to be using that chat function on your Zoom panel for any audience questions. So if you would like to put a question to Stephen, please submit it by writing into the chat side panel. Uh, if you can be as concise as possible, that would be much appreciated just so we can keep track of those questions easily. Secondly, I'm pleased to say that for any journalists who are joining us, that Stephen is speaking on the record this evening. So his answers to any of your questions are publishable, if you could also reference both the book, obviously, and the event. If we end up with too many questions to fit in to this live event, I do believe that Stephen's going to record possibly a separate video answering any leftover questions after we've finished, and Lewis Press will send that out to you as registered attendees. So don't worry too much if we don't get around to your question. Thirdly, most importantly, of course, the book is now available to purchase. Uh, if you just can't wait until after the event to actually do so, you can go to the Lewith website, lewith.co.uk, uh, while we're talking here. And a link is also going to be put up on your screen at the end of the event as well. Uh, so many thanks indeed for all joining us this evening. Let's crack on uh, with the main event. For those of you who, who perhaps don't know, Stephen Gethins is currently Professor of Practice at the School of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. He's a former SNP MP and spokesperson on international affairs and someone with a direct experience of diplomacy and NGO work in conflict zones such as the Caucasus and the Balkans. Having read Nation to Nation myself, privileged to read an advanced copy, uh, I can say it's arrived at a very opportune moment. Only this week we've had, you know, the UK government setting out its foreign policy priorities. Uh, we're only a few months into Britain's fundamentally different relationship with the European Union after the deal that was agreed at the end of 2020. And of course, we have Scottish parliamentary elections in less than two months time. Now, how Scotland reacts to and charts a course through all of this is the subject of some existing brilliant debate and discussion of this, which this book is undoubtedly a part. Stephen's work presents to us how Scotland historically has projected itself abroad, and it speaks to a wide range of politicians in both the UK and abroad about Scotland's future, either as part of the UK or as an independent state. So before I hand over to Stephen, we're also thrilled to be joined this evening by Mark Muller Stewart QC, who has written the foreword to this book. Mark is the founder of Beyond Borders. It's a Scottish nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering peace and international exchange as well as being a leading advocate specialising in human rights and public international law. He's also a senior mediation advisor to the United Nations Department of Political Affairs. He's worked throughout the Middle East, Asia and Africa, and written a number of books, including Storm in the Desert, in which he notes Scotland's potential in the field of small nation diplomacy and cultural dialogue. So I've got great pleasure in handing over to Mark, who will now say a few words about that and Stephen's book, Mark. Thank you very much, Tom, and congratulations, Stephen, uh, on this important book. Um, I mean, to my mind, Scotland's evolving foreign policy footprint uh, and your book could not have arrived at more opportune and timely moment for the reasons that Tom cited. And this is so irrespective of whether or, or not you're in favour of independence or a renegotiated enduring union with England. Um, as Tom noted, I think there are five real reasons why I find this book so timely uh, and so opportune. Tom referred, first of all, to the UK-EU Brexit agreement, and it seems to me undoubtedly the case that the four nations of the United Kingdom, as well as Europe uh, and the wider world, including the UN, are only just beginning to digest uh, and process the full implications of the UK leaving the European Union. The repatriation of certain powers back to the UK touches upon Scotland's devolved settlement and its foreign policy footprint. With those returning power comes a new debate about the future direction of all four nations and how Scotland sees and positions itself in that debate is gonna have a fundamental effect on its students, workers, businesses, and artists wanting to study, work, trade, and perform abroad. 
Um, Stephen's book helps us think through these issues. But what is clear to me is that we cannot just return to the status quo ante that existed before we joined the European Union. And that is because Scotland and the world has transformed since that moment. So the second reason why I find this book so important is because it charts how Scotland has changed since we've entered the European Union. And I don't mean to just say because it has its own government now or parliament, but also because it has a new and vibrant civil society with connections all over the world. While its educational institutions and cultural festivals, including my own, have truly become globalized. So more than ever, Scottish institutions want their voices to be heard on a range of global issues, and they expect their parliament to do so as well. I think people are not content to let non-devolved institutions speak exclusively on their behalf. So Westminster needs to understand that Scotland's desire to have a greater say in international affairs is part of a natural political development based around its history and the emergence of a set of Northern European orientated values. Now, Tom has also talked about the timeliness because of the Scottish par parliamentary elections. I think it's clear that we have a real policy choice before us. I heard recently Douglas Alexander say that devolution, and I quote, was an experiment in social justice. I think the Scottish people have moved on from this more limited 1997 conception. They want parliament to speak on global affairs and how it affects their lives. They're not content for the foreign policy footprint to just be about rugby, whiskey, and Walter Scott type heritage. So the real question is not so much whether or not Parliament should speak to such affairs, but how? And I think Stephen's book helps us think that through. Now, just from a UN perspective, I just want to make one point, and that is there's already an existing international policy issue as to how Scotland and other sub-state entities take up their role as global citizens, particularly in the light of the UN Millennium Goals but also as a result of certain international normative instruments uh, around human rights and peacemaking that impose important obligations on all parties, not just states, but subnational bodies and non-state actors. We only have to take the issue of climate change to realize that, uh, that, you know, that global problems and solutions are, are, um, don't have any boundaries or borders and that there is an urgent need to pool and share rather than to protect and restrict sovereignty. Now, many of us believe that the reserve matters arrangements that currently exist are not adequate to deal with these type of new policy questions and international obligations. And both the UK and Scottish government cannot duck these types of issues, particularly given the hosting of COP. There is a real question about whether the Blackstonian conception of sovereignty that has underpin much of government's thinking towards the EU and devolution is in fact fit for purpose in this highly internationalized society. And lastly, before I just touch upon my own experiences uh, in relation to peacemaking in Scotland, um, Tom mentioned the British government foreign policy review. I question whether or not the domestic and foreign policy dictimony is in fact fit for the 21st century environment. The Biden administration, for example, has begun to do away with this distinction as it recognizes dom domestic policy is connected to global issues like climate change, trade, security and human rights. It's not clear to me whether or not, in fact, uh, the FCO reached out to Scottish ministers or indeed uh, to previous first ministers or to, or to consider whether or not it should develop a more asymmetric, multi-dimensional foreign policy that draws upon the particular strengths of the soft power capacities of the four nations, including their historical relationships to other countries and their small nation diplomatic ca uh, capability. So just finishing, what I really wanted to explore with you is whether or not Scotland does have that capacity. Now, as a conflict resolver who has been involved in a multitude of different types of conflicts around the world, we used to take many conflict parties to South Africa and Northern Ireland to learn the lessons of, of how you have a successful political transition within a conflict setting. 
And we began to sort of discuss whether or not we could bring them to Scotland. Why did we do that? Because we began to understand that Scotland has had one of the most remarkable constitutional journeys in Europe uh, in the last 50 years. And that many of the conflicts we were dealing with actually involved issues to do with autonomy and the devolution of power. So in 2010, we created Beyond Borders, and it was a cross-party, uh, bipartisan effort, but to see whether or not Scotland could play a real role in helping peacemaking efforts around the world. Why was that? One, because it has a very powerful uh, image and brand around the world and was immediately accessible to a number of groups who were struggling with their own issues of identity and how to devolve power. But secondly, its cultural institutions and educational institutions gave it a soft power capacity to help in this type of work. Over the course of the last 10 years, we have brought a range of different groups involved in conflict uh, to Scotland, be it the Turks and the Kurds, the Bahrainis, the Omanis, the Basques, many other groups as well. And they have found Scotland to be a safe and neutral place in which they can discuss their own issues, but also learn important lessons. Along with that, we have also created at Beyond Borders the International Women's Peacemaking Fellowship as a, as a consequence of uh, its relationship both with the Scottish Government and the United Nations. We have now trained over 250 women peacemakers from around the world. And we have created an alumni program which assists actively different types of processes. In the moment, at the moment, they're in the process of assisting the EU uh, in support of the Afghan peace process. We have also brought the UN special envoys to Syria and Yemen to Scotland. And its a women's advisory board have worked closely with a number of Scottish institutions. So I just end by saying this, if people thought that the proposition was untested about Scotland's ability to contribute to fundamental global issues, we've tested that, that, that whole contention. And it seems to me that actually many different uh, institutions around the world, particularly in relation to peacemaking, but also in relation to the rule of law and climate change, now look to small nations like Scotland who can play a small nation diplomatic role in helping others to overcome conflict uh, and to overcome misunderstandings. So that's really the contribution I wanted to make. Uh, I think what's so important about Stephen's book is it deals with all of those issues, but I would say also that it's packed full of fun historical facts about Scotland's existing relationship to other parts of the world uh, and it deals also with all the changes that have happened over the last few years. So it sets it up for a, 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 a quite extraordinary debate, which I think is heading Scotland and England's way about actually how small nations can, in actual fact, play a fundamental role as a global citizen in today's highly internationalised world. Thank you for listening. And well done, Stephen, for, for writing the book. Mark, thank you so much for that. Uh, really interesting and wonderful to have someone of Mark's experience uh, introduce the book as well. And Stephen, I think, you know, just leading as soon as we can into questions, I, I will kick us off. And, and broadly, you know, what Mark's talking about there is, is quite insightful in that to the casual observer, I think many people wouldn't realise that that sort of work has already been taking place in Scotland. And it's, you know, beyond borders as an NGO who are undertaking it, no doubt with assistance from politicians and other aspects of civil society. But one of the main themes of your book is that this has been going on in Scotland in terms of carving out a niche when it comes to foreign policy. So broadly, tell us why you wanted to write the book and what you want people to get out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And, and, and first of all, I just want a huge thanks to Mark, who wrote the foreword. And, and, and he and I have spoken about this for a number of years now. And, and Mark's always insightful and, and interesting, as were so many other people. So the reason I wanted to write the book was, as Mark's outlined there, Scotland has a distinctive foreign policy footprint. And in the first chapter, I looked at history. I'm not a historian, but I thought, well, 
let's look at history. In history, Scotland has been shaped domestically and has shaped the rest of the world because of its international footprint. And it's sometimes a foreign policy, especially today with a foreign policy without a foreign ministry that's hidden in plain sight. Um, I don't want to linger on what happened centuries ago, but for those of you who, have, um, who know about William Wallace, well, the only document that we know that existed from William Wallace, it was written in his own hand, was the letter of Lubeck, which was written just after the Battle of Stirling Bridge. And it was a letter to the Hanseatic League, the EU of its day saying Scotland is now open for business. And the independence that Scotland won at that time came to an end um, in part, not entirely, but in part because of a failed foreign policy venture with the Darien scheme, with an attempt to set up a colony in Panama that bankrupt the country. And since then, Scots have had an impact on the rest of the world through the colonization process and the diaspora. And you see that throughout the world with our brand. There are now something like, um, if there are 70 million members of the diaspora, there are 14 members of the diaspora for every Scot living in Scotland. And I was able to draw on some really interesting work, including by Momentous Change and by others, um, looking into that diaspora connection and drawing on that as well. And we've seen the evolution of Scotland's foreign policy footprint even within the current devolution, within the devolution settlement and before that. And Philip Rycroft, who was uh, the head of the department for leaving the European Union at the end of his civil service career, started that career in the Scotland office with Conservative ministers um, trying to influence what was going on in the European Union um, in terms of Scotland's interests and also in the broader world and talks about that at a global level as well. So I was really lucky. I was able to interview about 50 or 60 people from, uh, from around the world who gave me their insights. Um, but in particular, and I was really keen to do this, especially with the current political situation, I was really fortunate that people who don't share my views, I'm somebody who's in favour of independence, but people um, like Ian Duncan, the Scotland Office Minister, Jack Connell, Henry McLeish, um, and others gave me their insights on how they see Scotland's foreign policy developing. And I'll finish with, with this initially, um, and I'm happy to go into more details, but Scotland sits at that hinge at the moment, and its place in the world is now at the heart of our politics in a way it hasn't been for decades. The elephant in the room is Brexit. And the UK that goes in has already changed since January um, when, when the, the UK left the EU transition period. And the UK that goes into the next general election in 2024 will be a radically different UK with radically different relationships with the rest of the world and internally from the one that went into the December 2019 general election. And that means that this isn't a debate that we can afford to have at some future debate. It's a debate that we need to have right now. There is no such thing as the status quo in terms of our relationship with the rest of the world. And that poses significant challenges for those who are in favour of independence and those who are in favour of the union. If you're in favour of independence, how do you interact with the rest of these islands as a result of Brexit? You need to think about that and the new challenges that that poses. But if you're in favour of the union, how does Scotland express itself? How does it interact with this undoubted brand and a different way of doing politics and divergent views within the union? And that's a question that those who believe in the union will have to answer. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Stephen. Sorry, just a few hits at the button to unmute myself there. Um, questions, questions starting to come in. So just if you are um, an audience uh, member and you do need some potential inspiration for questions, it's probably worth me telling you a little bit about what's in Stephen's book. He talks, as he's already mentioned, about this, that the diaspora, the Scottish diaspora and the power of that. Um, he talks a lot about Scotland's relationship, not only with, of course, the EU, but some of our neighbours in the high north and the Arctic. So if anyone has any questions about that. And of course, as we've already alluded to, the difference of approach, whether Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom or is an independent state. Before I go to, to audience questions, Stephen, just following on from, from something you said there about this sort of this crossroads that Scotland and the rest of the UK finds itself at. And just bringing up the integrated review that, that was published yesterday by the UK government. Yeah. Now, reading through it, it you know, it essentially believes that this post-Cold War global order, that system of rules-based multilateralism, is, is either over or certainly coming to an end. And then I'll quote from the review. 
Today, the international order is more fragmented, characterized by intensifying competition between states over interests, norms, and values. A defense of the status quo is no longer sufficient for the decade ahead. So the question I want to ask is your vision of Scotland that you portray in this book, couched in the defense of that status quo and a geopolitical order that doesn't exist anymore or is in its death throes? Uh, and, and, it, and, and if so, you know, whether it's independent or not, do you think that there's an even bigger divergence 24 hours on from that review being published and how the UK sees the world and how Scotland sees the world? That's a really good question. And um, one of the challenges of writing a book is it's, it takes you, um, well, it took me the past nine months to, 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 to a year and I benefited from lockdown in that geography wasn't a problem in speaking to people and I could take 20 minutes out of people's days around the world. Um, but part of the problem in writing a book over months is that things change almost by the hour. And we've seen that even in the past 24 hours with the, um, with the strategic review that the British government have published. Um, that quote that you highlight, I think, exemplifies the divergence that's gone on between Holyrood and Westminster. At Westminster, there is that consensus that you have a more unilateralist view, that these geopolitical orders that have come together over, over over the past few decades, certainly since the Second World War, are somehow fragmenting. Not all of, not everybody takes that view. And what was really interesting, speaking to German, Irish, EU, American, Canadian politicians, was that the UK, and I'll say this, and others will disagree, and, 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 and some of those that I interviewed will disagree with this, um, take the view that that is the case. I do not take that view. And I'm afraid to say that I increasingly see a UK that is pursuing a unilateralist agenda as compared to all of its neighbours that are increasingly pursuing a multilateralist agenda, which is much more at home in Scotland. So on that view, I remember speaking to a Danish politician, a former cabinet minister, Rasmus um, helvig Peterson, who said to me, the Danes, well, we're members of everything. We rely on the international order because it strengthens our sovereignty. It strengthens our independence and it gives us clout. And that pooling and sharing of sovereignty is something that's incredibly important to our international partners and something which I think is accepted in Scotland. When Scotland voted to remain overwhelmingly in the European Union, I was at the time, I think a 62% vote was at the time something that other European politicians would have bit your hand off for 62% on a leave remain vote at that time. It's changed. The rest of Europe has become more pro-European as the folly of Brexit, as I see it, as the folly of Brexit has unfolded. So when you have embracing of multilateralism, the Scottish government is finding its niche in climate diplomacy, working with the UN in issues like conflict, as Mark underlined, and also seeing a future for itself within the EU, where independence means the pooling and sharing of sovereignty. You see a distinct divergence between that consensus in Holyrood and a consensus around unilateralism um, at Westminster, global Britain has to mean something. And what struck me from my time in Parliament was that the UK doesn't know what global Britain means, and they've yet to find that place. And I suspect that's where the um, strategic review is trying to find its place. I have to say, the investing in nuclear weapons, the commitment by the UK to potentially break international law, now leaves the UK much more isolated than it was prior to 2014. And that's why I go back, it's a debate that we need to have right now because there is no status quo any longer about Scotland's place in the world and about the UK's place in the world. Just finally then, Stephen, from me on that, should, the, should Scotland remain part of the United Kingdom? How does it fit into the vision of the world that that strategic review paints? And what advice would you give to unionist politicians and union supporters on how to constructively engage the Scottish government with that sort of outlook? So this is something I explore in the book and I'd, I'd argue for a greater decentralization of, of foreign policy as you get in other countries. So the first thing I'd say is Scotland has an international brand it has this massive diaspora were Scotland to be independent, it would start um, in a much more prepared place and, and, and in a place with the international community that would be far in advance to other newly independent um, states. 
although that needs work. The Scottish Government clearly needs to do some work in that regard, and that's something else that we can come on to. But from a unionist perspective, how do you make use of that brand? How do you make use of that diaspora? And how do you engage with the aspirations of the people of Scotland? Now, there are easy ways you can do it. And um, David Campbell Bannerman, um, who, who spoke to me, was very interesting. David, as a strong Brexiteer, he was a Conservative member of the European Parliament. And he made the suggestion, well, he doesn't understand with the UK having so many problems with the US in terms of a trade deal. Why didn't the UK use the political and diplomatic clout of the Scottish diaspora? That was one idea that David came, came up with. Um, but for me, it has to be more deep seated than that. If you are, there are many challenges for the independence movement at the moment, but, and it's maybe not fair of me to illustrate the, cha the challenges that the unionist movement has, but let me give it a shot. One of them is you have to be into your 60s before you're in a demographic that is in a, that, that is in a majority that believes in the union. You have generations who have switched off the state of which they carry the passport. They do not identify with its aims, ambitions, and they, and they increasingly believe in Scottish independence. Their aims and aspirations are reflected in Scotland, and I explore this in the book, in things like strong action on climate change, membership of the European Union, a feminist foreign policy as well, which is something I was learning about as I wrote the book. So you need to engage with those aspirations. And you could look elsewhere. So for example, in Flanders, um, Flemish um, officials overseas have a broad network, they work with the Belgian authorities, and officials have got the same status, uh, Flemish officials have the same status as Belgian um, officials, so there is no diplomatic hierarchy. The Danish, one of our neighbours, really good example, it sets out in the Danish um, Foreign Ministry website the responsibilities of the Faroese and the Greenlandic authorities who are encouraged to pursue their own foreign policy for the betterment of the economy, for profits and principles that the Faroese and the Greenlanders um, have to the extent, and if anybody's watched the film Greenland, they'll be aware of this, um, that you have the US military base in Greenland and the signatures on that defence treaty, and it's a defence treaty, are the Danish authorities, the US authorities and the Greenlandic authorities. And even when Donald Trump famously offered to buy Greenland in the past couple of years, it was the um, Danish prime minister who stood in and, 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 and said, not only is Greenland not for sale, but it's not for us to put Greenland up for sale because we recognise that autonomy in Greenland's particular place in the world. So there are other states who do this and they do this better, I'm afraid. Thanks for that, Stephen. OK, let's let's go to audience questions. Uh, we'll start with Malcolm Fleming. Stephen, what are your thoughts on Scotland's international development role, especially the Malawi relationship? And what opportunities do you see for that developing when Scotland gains the powers of independence? Malcolm word, Malcolm's words, not mine. So um, Malcolm makes a really good point. And, and actually, Malcolm um, is somebody who's worked in this sector and I've, I've, I've drawn from him in the book, and Malcolm, like so many people, made a really valuable contribution. Um, I have to say that at first, I was a little bit skeptical about the relationship between Scotland and Malawi. It's not somewhere I've worked. Um, I've, I've worked in the South Caucasus, worked in Namibia, uh, worked in the Western Balkans. But actually, it was such an interesting model as I got into it, because you have an organic relationship that exists between Scotland and Malawi. And you've got the Scotland-Malawi partnership and the Malawi-Scotland partnership. And between them, they have hundreds of organizations, local communities, and they interact with each other. And I was asked the question, um, I was asked the question earlier on, I was talking to some university colleagues about this, and they said, how does Scotland deal with its historic colonial legacy? Um, and actually, it's not for me to answer that. And I would refer to the Scotland-Malawi partnership and the Malawi-Scotland partnership, who put out a really interesting statement, which is paraphrased in the book, and I'd encourage anybody who's interested to go and read it in full, which acknowledges the mistakes, but it acknowledges honestly the legacy. And it's only by acknowledging that legacy that you can take things forward. So I think that Scotland-Malawi partnership is a really good model because if Scotland is to grow its foreign policy footprint, then you will obviously be developing the relationships beyond that with Malawi to other states. But I think that that partnership forms a really good model about how you can interact with similar states in a spirit of partnership, which is really, really 
important. And that's something where you often have a lack in, in, in other interactions. And Jack McConnell made a really interesting observation as well. He said that when he was dealing with Malawian authorities, that Scotland was able to interact much more partnership with a much more honest interaction than, say, some of the big donors. Now, if you can move to be a full state and still capture that spirit of partnership, then that's something that's worthwhile doing as you start to move towards that. So I think there's, so it's been, whenever you write a book, I've, been, I've learned a lot from this, and that was something that I learned from these conversations and um, with people who are deeply involved with that relationship, as to be fair, Malcolm has been over the years. Excellent. Thanks, Malcolm, for that. Um, on to our next question, uh, Alistair Burt, and I'm assuming that is the uh, former Foreign Office Minister, Alistair Burt, as well. So thank you, Alistair. He says, hello, Stephen. Good to see you. Congratulations on the book. The mention of the union in the review perhaps opens the opportunity for a greater voice in UK policy, even if Scotland ultimately remains in the union. Do you agree? And what is the mechanism? I suppose maybe some of what you mentioned before, but, but maybe yeah, that specific mechanism and how the UK government could make it work better. Yeah, so one thing that people don't see, um, and I've tried to reflect this in the book, I have my own views about independence and I'm, 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 I'm a believer in independence. But if we're to take forward this discussion, I hope this book opens up this debate discussion, I was really keen to engage with those who disagree with me, thoughtful people who disagree with me. Alistair's a thoughtful person who disagrees with me on this. I'm really pleased to see him here today. He's somebody that, that, that thinks about this. Um, as I've set out in the book, there are ways that the UK government could make more of Scotland's brand. You can put the institutional mechanisms, but I think that has to be set out. The Danes, the Belgians, the Germans, in Canada, they explicitly set out the powers and responsibilities and foreign policy that their sub-state actors have. One illustration is in Canada. Now, in Canada, when they were signing the CETA trade arrangements with the EU, they involved all of their provinces as part of the negotiating team, which meant that when that trade deal had to be signed off, that the provinces and their respective um, assemblies and devolved administrations had been an integral part of that process. That makes decision-making more difficult and a little bit longer, but decisions, political decisions um, should be a little bit more difficult. If that makes life slightly more uncomfortable for the politicians, then that's, then that's fine. So I think that institutionalizing some of these differences and, and respecting um, the role that Scotland can play. An illustration I have in the, in the book, and I thought this was a missed opportunity from the UK's perspective, was I looked back at the Copenhagen Climate Summit in 2009. Now at that time, Scotland had just passed world leading legislation. It had been unanimously passed by all political parties. They'd gone to 42% reductions by 2020 that they met. That was endorsed by the Conservatives, Liberal Democrats, Labour, and the SNP and the Greens because it was a minority parliament. It was also endorsed and worked towards by um, civil society, by academia, by business. So you had a proper community approach. And Scotland was winning plaudits throughout the world for it. The, the Scottish government asked to be part of the UK's team for, the, for that climate summit, and it was rejected. So Alex Ammond at the time just turned up in Copenhagen and he was able to work with civic society doing things, signed an agreement with the Maldives, with President Nasheed of the Maldives, met up with Arnold Schwarzenegger and other sub-state actors. They were even dishing out bottles of 42% um, uh, carbon neutral whiskey at that summit, which might sound like a gimmicky thing to do, but Scotland got noticed in that international environment. And as an official from another government said to me um, of that, they didn't understand why the UK didn't play the whole team. So the UK had this great news story. And even though I'm somebody that believes in independence, I, you know, if, if, if you're a unionist, you have, to, you have to believe in playing the whole team. And at the moment, the Foreign Office is not playing the whole team. And we're also at a stage with the UK being seen, the UK's brand is taking a battering since Brexit, I'm afraid to say. Um, and, I'll, and, and fair play to people like Alistair Burt, who worked exceptionally hard in Parliament to try and reach out across, um, across political lines. But we do not have a government at the moment that recognises the benefits of reaching out to other devolved administrations. And I don't think it's a, a properly unionist administration in that regard. So 
it has been written into the strategic defence review, but you need to see more action um, rather than simply words. And shifting some civil servants around the place does not a long-term policy make. Okay, Stephen, thanks. Uh, Anthony Salamone uh, of European Merchants Think Tank here in Scotland. Congratulations, Stephen. Particularly due to Brexit, it's clear that many more people in Scotland are interested in talking about EU and international affairs than before. Your book is a great contribution to informing the debate. But at the same time, also due to Brexit, our political discourse is so fractured now. How do you think we can encourage more cross-party cooperation and wider public discussion here on Scotland's place in the world? Yeah, it's a really good question. And thankfully, we've got people like Anthony who um, is making his own thoughtful and detailed contribution to that. And I would encourage anybody who wants to do a little bit further reading to go and have a look at European Merchant and Anthony in particular's work around this and some really thoughtful contributions and challenges for those who believe in independence and those who believe in the union. So first of all, I think we need to talk about this. And again, it comes back to one of the reasons I was so keen to engage with people that don't share my worldview was I wanted to understand where they see this going. Now, Scotland's role in the world and Scotland's place in the international community now sits at the heart of the independence debate. Brexit has driven the debate. And if you look at John Curtis um, saying that one in five no voters now back yes is a direct consequence of the Brexit vote and our relationship with the European Union. That said, if you're going to have a new relationship, no one party, no one um, group can drive that. And I think there needs to be a recognition in the independence movement, the wider independence movement, of the broader challenges that Brexit has brought um, and the aspirations that are had across the rest of these islands. And what I would argue is if you believe in independence, you must believe generously in independence. And that means that you must make the case to other European states that independence will help build bridges between London and Brussels and help rebuild that relationship. Just as the Irish have been a critical friend to the UK throughout this difficult and painful Brexit process, so must the argument be made that an independent Scotland would actually act as a bridge to, to um, close the gaps that have opened up. Now, they're not being helped by things like a UK government that refuses to give diplomatic representation, the only country on earth that refuses to give diplomatic, re diplomatic um, recognition to the EU ambassador in London. That creates division unnecessarily. Um, but similarly, we have to recognise that voters in England and Wales had their decision and how can we make that work for everybody? And incidentally, from my conversations with politicians elsewhere in Europe, that is something that politicians across Europe and our stakeholders across Europe are looking at, they will, not, they will not seek to influence the debate, they will not have an opinion on the debate, but they will want to know that Scotland is being a good international actor. Now, the flip side of that is I think that unionists cannot stick their fingers in the ears if you look at the polling, if you look at the way that generations are switching off the UK at the moment in Scotland, they cannot stick their fingers in their ears and ignore this question. People are being switched off the union because of Brexit. They're being switched off the union because they see a divergence um, between the political consensus in Edinburgh and, Hall and in Edinburgh and Westminster, driven by our place in the world. So my encouragement would be to my friends who believe in the union is read the book and please criticise it because at least it means we're talking about it, but do so in a constructive way. And I hope that this makes a small contribution to that ongoing debate. And I'm so grateful to those who don't share my worldview, like Alistair and others, who were so open and talking to me um, and, 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 and let me learn a little bit more about the way that they see um, Scotland's role in the world developing. Can I follow up just on, on the EU aspect that Anthony sort of mentioned and the fact that more of us are interested in, in EU international affairs, but I wonder what you've made of, of just the last few weeks. You know, just anecdotally, it would seem that off the back of the Brexit vote, pro-Europeans, of course, have had a pretty um, good ride in terms of how they compare the United Kingdom to the European Union, if you have a pro-European Union mindset anyway. However, in the last few weeks, and I'm talking about COVID-19 and I'm talking about vaccines here, have you yourself thought, uh, had any further thoughts about um, you know, how, how opinions might be quite, uh, you know, based on quite shaky ground at times, depending on what's happening and how they're reacting to something like that in the European Union? 
you know, one of the big challenges that we have in politics just now is a lack of any kind of nuance that, you know, there seems to be a belief that's crept in that the EU can do no right um, among some and for some that the UK can do no, no right. The UK has had a good vaccine rollout. Um, there have been some challenges in some European countries, but let's not forget the UK could have opted out of that vaccine rollout at any point. And it's that fundamental misunderstanding about what membership of the EU means. It's in treaty with various opt-outs that countries can have. So my encouragement would be nuance. But there is an overall question here rather than individuals. Overall, how do we see our futures? Kat Tully, who gave what the Foreign Affairs Committee described as Scottish separatism back in 2013, um, had a really interesting question, and it is a question as much for those who believe in independence as those who believe in the union. And her question is, um, for us all, where do you see your country seven generations from now? So overall, and there will be bumps on the road, sometimes you know, there, there, there are benefits and drawbacks of everything. Do we see our future as one with other members of the European Union? Do we see it as an integrated part, as a an independent member state of the European Union. Now that means that there are challenging questions. That means that we need to think about how the relationship with the rest of the UK works, how the border works, and the difficult questions that Ireland has had to face up to in the past few years. But that is a model that has been pursued by all of our partners and even Norway, which sits outside the EU, sits in very close proximity to the rest of the European Union. And there's a challenge from a unionist perspective, which is being an independent member state of the European Union is the norm in terms of our politics nowadays. Drifting away from the European Union as a European country is not the norm. Now, we won't know for sure who's right and who's wrong um, seven generations from now, however you count a generation, but that's for a different debate. But what we do know is that there are 27 member states who have seen belief in the European Union grown as a result of Brexit, who don't think it's a terribly good idea. We see people in Scotland who still believe in European Union membership, with opinion polls showing that support has grown from, gone from about 62% to 70% in some opinion polls. So my, I, I would say, yes, criticise the EU, and the EU is open to criticism and it makes mistakes, but also fundamentally, in the, what are the... If, if you're talking about these bigger questions, where do you see yourself? What do you think is overall in the best interests? I believe that that is Scotland being an independent member state of the European Union. But I have to make my case and I have to make that argument and I have to take the bumps on the road when they come. But the similar stasis goes for those who believe differently as well. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, back to audience questions. Craig Oldman, congratulations on the book. In terms of the Scottish universities dimension in all of this and the image and interface internationally, could you, as someone working in that sector and yourself a former beneficiary of the Erasmus scheme, comment on the likely damage done now to outward and inward looking opportunities for younger people in opting out of that albeit with a shift to the Turing scheme announced by the UK government and the ramifications also for the perspectives you're looking at in your book. And education is something you do mention quite a lot in your book, Stephen. Yeah. So the first point that I make to everybody is that those who think Scotland doesn't have a foreign policy, well, foreign policy is not something that is generated simply in foreign ministries at a politician to politician level. Foreign policy and our international affairs is something that sub-state actors throughout the world engaged in, local authorities engage in. In fact, just look at the impact that cities like Glasgow and Aberdeen had on the anti-apartheid struggle, for example, as an illustration I make in the book. And the same goes for our universities. I work in the higher education sector now. The University of St Andrews is an unashamedly internationalist institution that brings in people from throughout the world and engages with partners throughout the world. Its success is built on international engagement. Um, I think that withdrawing from Erasmus has been incredibly damaging because not only does it make it less accessible, but um, the Turing scheme does not have the same level of exchange element. Now the exchange element is incredibly important. It's not just about sending students, apprentices and others out for that experience, experience I had, 
but it's also about bringing people in as well and the benefits of sitting in a, a lecture theatre or a tutorial with students from a different country that maybe bring a slightly different perspective. Um, the higher education sectors in every country like to describe themselves as world leading. I'll only make this reflection. I think Scottish higher education system is genuinely world leading. As one former cabinet minister explained it to me, the Scottish higher education system is a sleeping giant. It is an enormous sector, but it relies on internationalization. Brexit has been damaging. And what's interesting with the bringing in of Turing, with the strategic review that's come in, is I can't see an alternative um, coming out from Westminster at the moment. And if you're a less attractive place to do business, if you're a less attractive place to live and work, then you become less competitive. If you're less competitive, you start losing out on funding and you start losing out on good people who want to come and live and work at your institution. Whether we like it or not, and this is something that those who believe in independence need to recognise, is that you have to be internationally competitive and our universities are competing on an international level and Brexit made them less competitive. And I think actually this next question maybe taps into some of what you're talking about. Roger Mullen um, saying, does Stephen agree that modern societies are characterised by accelerating uncertainty, yet many states, the UK included, hold on to a belief in reaching a stability that's unavailable? Therefore, states that are flexible in responding to a changing context and wise enough to reach out to their diaspora are more likely to successfully navigate the future. And something you talk about in the book is that link between obviously education and the diaspora, and maybe that speaks a bit to what Roger's asking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and, and Roger's got some really good knowledge and done some really good work on the diaspora on this, um, which has contributed to the, to, to the book as well as able to draw on Roger. Just as I was interestingly able to, um, to draw on some of Craig Oliphant who used to work at the FCO and had some fascinating insights about Scotland's place in the world and the way that we interact. And one of those insights that I got from talking to Craig and thinking about uh, and speaking to Roger was Scotland is not the UK. Scotland is not a mini UK, it's different. And the way we interact is different. And that community engagement and being light on your feet is something that smaller states can do. Now, I'm not a believer that Scotland is a small state. I know others described it, Alex Salmond used to describe it as this, and I disagreed with them on it. Scotland is, in global terms, and Europeans, a medium-sized state. But one thing that we have is that closer network so that the, the NGO sector, you know, I know Mark, I know people at Mercy Corps, um, at, at, at the Malawi-Scotland partnership that, that I referenced, people know each other in these networks, and these Scottish networks are smaller. That makes you lighter on your feet. And I was asked earlier on today by an academic colleague, can you think about, you know, I've drawn examples from Ireland and Norway um, from England and Ireland that, that, that we can learn from. And he said, do you have any out there examples that we can learn from? And I said, yes, Costa Rica, where that community engagement and that community interaction in shaping policy and therefore your foreign policy footprint becomes much more important. And on the diaspora and being flexible, um, the Scottish government is sometimes criticised for not being engaged enough in its diaspora. Now, the diaspora is about 70 million strong. Scotland's five and a half million of a population and will always have a, a smaller resource. But one thing that the Irish have done, and I know Roger's aware of this, so forgive me reiterating this, is having that much more light touch approach. But the Irish diaspora is able to anchor in its embassy network, its consulate um, network, and the Irish government does some really interesting work on reaching out to the immigrant community. There's an immigrant hardship fund. There's a medal for who's contributed most to the diaspora links over the year. So having that um, smaller um, uh, that, 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 that smaller network also means you can be much lighter on your feet and you can have that more coherent and organic relationship between, say, the NGO sector, the business sector, the higher education sector, as well as your diaspora as well. So don't try and control everything. Be a little bit lighter on your, on your feet. And it's something that, for example, the Irish are looking at how they do that in terms of their diaspora engagement just now. But I also look at other diasporas in terms of their engagement too. Uh, just got under 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna lump two questions in together for the next one. Vanessa Glynn and Chris Thacker, I think are sort of asking 
asking a similar question. So Vanessa says, how best can Scotland prepare itself from now for rejoining the EU domestically and by means of its diplomacy? And Chris says, do you think EEA or EFTA membership would be good for an independent Scotland to help win round the one and a half million leave voting Scots? So really good questions um, from, from both. Um, so I'm going to answer them separately, but first of all, I think Scotland has to prepare itself for rejoining the European Union. Every day that you're away from the European Union um, means is another day when 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 you're diverging slightly from um, from from the rest of the European Union. Um, and also, that seems to be the the, the will of the, the the people of Scotland um, as well. I think the Scottish government's right and to have to be to have its legislation that tries to be as close as it possibly can be in environmental and in other standards to the European Union. But of course, the internal market legislation um, means that there will be some changes. There'll be um, more centralization. So there'll be more divergence on a number of areas. Regional funding is a really good example that's been recentralized. And then you've got the frameworks around food and drink policy. But I think the Scottish government has limited resources. It's a fantastic resource in Scotland House. But I remember people saying to me, Scotland House has done really well. You know, David McAllister talked about how visible Scotland House officials were and Scottish ministers were in the aftermath of Brexit and having a very clear message and a coherent message as well. Um, Brexit means more bureaucrats, I'm afraid. The UKREP, the UK representation is going to have to be st staffed up. And I think Scotland House is going to have to be staffed up. And there will also have to be more political clout re leveraged at Brussels level. So it's a lot of work that has to be done. But I think that work has to start right now in terms of domestically and domestic legislation, but also diplomatically as well. And I think Vanessa is spot on. On Chris's point on EEA EFTA, um, I think it'd be very difficult for Scotland to reject EU membership, given the overwhelming mandate, if you like, that EU membership received. He's right to highlight the one and a half leave milli, um, million leave voting Scots, but they're in a minority in Scotland, you know, and, and we're talking about if Scotland was to be independent and if you're reflecting. And what's really interesting in the polling, and I saw some of John Curtis's work on this rather than mine, is that John Curtis talks about those who voted leave, um, but were in favour of independence before, haven't drifted towards the union, whereas a significant number of Remain voting unionists from 2014 or those who voted no have drifted towards um, have drifted towards independence. So in many ways, the choice that people have got is shaping up quite nicely. The choice is, and it has to be a very clear choice, of a Scotland as an independent member state of the European Union. That is the offer that certainly the Scottish government can have. Um, and I think it has to be clear that the aspirations of an independent Scotland will be to rejoin the EU. And I think it has to be honest. And I think the people that anybody who decides in a future independence referendum has to know that they would be voting for a Scottish government, that, that they're voting for an independent Scottish government that would be seeking in, um, member status of the European Union. That said, Brexit teaches us that if you vote in a government that doesn't believe in membership of the European Union, then you can leave the European Union much more easily than you can leave the UK Union. So the choice ultimately rests with the people who live and work in Scotland. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I think this will probably be our last question. It's an interesting one as well. Andrew Neil, congratulations on the book. Sounds like an important contribution to the debate. While undoubtedly there is extensive international goodwill towards Scotland and its brand, how can you be sure that this would hold after independence? For example, an internationalist foreign policy and continued active membership of NATO as favoured by Angus Robertson, maybe more provocative internationally than the more restrained Irish model, which does not seem to be favoured by the SNP. So, um, Andrew, a really good question from Andrew, who's just, just published a book as well, very interesting book on security and its interaction with politics. So a very pertinent question from Andrew there. Um, just as Scotland isn't a mini UK, Scotland cannot cut out and paste its foreign policy from other countries. And that's why we need to have this debate and discussion right now. And I hope this book contributes to it in some ways. We don't have the same history as Ireland in terms of a standing army, in terms of um, our engagement internationally. 
And whereas I think the Irish model is quite a good one in many ways, foreign policy wise, in terms of its soft power clout, in terms of diaspora, in terms of how it engages with the rest of the world, I don't think that applies at a security level. And it was really interesting, um, even if you take the United States out of the equation, even if you take England and Wales and how they see things out of the equation, how we see our Nordic friends and allies see things. And as one day Danish politician said to me, he said, you know, your geography and that Iceland gap makes you really interesting. And, um, and I, I remember speaking to a former ambassador to NATO in Norway, who, who said, your Nordic members will want to know that you take security seriously. And with the opening up of the ice caps with an increased threat from Russia, um, I think Scotland has to step up to the plate. And I was really mindful of what um, Rasmus Peterson, the Danish politician said to me, said, we're members of everything and we'd like to see something similar from Scotland. I think it gives you more clout. So I think Scotland has to take its security consideration seriously. I think that we do not become, if we become independent, it is not in the same place that Ireland became independent. We've, we're a different country with a different history. And although that would probably be our closest partner um, and the one that we have closest links to, we would have a, a different way of doing our foreign policy in terms of security. And I think that um, Angus has historically been right, and I backed him in that in terms of NATO membership. And I think our partners will want to see us take that seriously. But this is a debate that we need to be having because these are serious questions that we need to, to, to be asking ourselves. Yeah, Stephen, thank you. And thanks very much for, for all your questions. As um, Lewis Press have also put in the chat box, if you do have anything that you uh, think of after the event's finished uh, and you'd like Stephen to answer, uh, do post them still here. So if you've got in the next three minutes or so, and we're going to save this chat function so that Stephen can answer those questions a bit later on uh, but we are running now out of time and uh, that's the end of pretty much of this event so I will just thank you all very much indeed for attending tonight uh, thanks so much to of course Stephen for, for writing the book I can highly recommend it it is I think importantly for any political strike whether you think that Scotland's future is inside the United Kingdom or as an independent state it has got something for everyone reading it I think it's a really really important contribution to the debate also a big thanks to Mark Muller Stewart QC for introducing um, the book for writing the foreword as well um, earlier on this evening I'll just mention as well before I tell you where to find Stephen's book that Mark uh, and his Beyond Borders NGO is hosting an event tomorrow evening I put a link for it into the chat box uh, it's an evening hosted by Razia Iqbal, features Monica McWilliams, who co-founded the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition and took part in the Good Friday Agreement, amongst others. They're talking about US society and the fractures that currently exist within US society and approaching it from a, a conflict resolution angle. So it sounds like a really interesting event that's launching a whole program of other things to come over the year. So the link for that is in the chat box at the side. Lewis Press website, lewispress.co.uk will get you to Stephen's book and it's available right now. He has a physical copy that he's going to hold up, I hope, maybe. So I should have done it already. That arrived this <laughs> afternoon. Many thanks to you, Lewis. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can get that uh, from the Lewis Press website. I think there'll be a card that's put up at the very end of this chat that you can, you can link to that, but you can obviously just go to their website. And as it's 6.59, there's nothing more to do for me to do than say thank you so much to all of you for joining. Thanks to Stephen, thanks to Mark, and we wish you all a very good evening and go and buy the book. <laughs>